Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Santa Fe Opera. Good evening, and welcome to the fourth episode of Songs from the Santa Fe Opera, celebrating the five originally scheduled opening nights of the 2020 season. I'm Amanda Eschelaz, and I am thrilled to welcome you, albeit virtually, to the Wincote Opera Club, overlooking the stage of the Crosby Theatre, the Hemmers Mountains to the west, and of course, what no Santa Fe Opera evening would be complete without, the sunset. Here on the second floor in the Turner Family Lounge, opening night is a huge celebration. Everyone is dressed in their opera best, be that tuxedos, bolo ties, and ample sequins and turquoise. The club is positively buzzing with energy and anticipation. And you'll often find yourself at the balcony admiring the sunset. You look to your left to find a rising opera singer, stage director, or even a Supreme Court Justice rock star, you know who I mean, all taking in the same glorious view. This evening, we are celebrating Dvorak's Rizalka, a tale of love, desire, immortality, and a touch of dark magic. But before we get too carried away, be sure, please, to pour yourself a glass of bubbly, my personal favorite, and prepare for a spectacular evening don't forget to share photos of your at-home tailgate with the hashtags SFOFashion and show us your tailgate. And no, that is not a euphemism. Extra points, ladies, for mermaid fins. After all, we are telling the story of a water nymph. My own journey to Santa Fe was slightly less supernatural, but almost as improbable as a water nymph in the desert. I was born in South Africa to parents who always played classical music at home, and every evening my father would blast out the opera pop, so you could say I was initiated very early on. And by the age of 12, I knew I wanted to be an opera singer. A few years and many, many voice lessons later, I was selected to represent South Africa in the Cardiff Singer of the World competition. My dreams had come true. My singing career took me around the globe before finally coming to Santa Fe for my American debut, singing the title role in Tosca, 2012. When I stepped off the plane in New Mexico, I was completely struck by the feeling of familiarity. The sweeping views, the bright open skies just reminded me of parts of South Africa. Within the first few weeks at the opera, I knew I'd arrived somewhere truly unique. It really felt like a community with everyone working tirelessly to meet the company's high artistic standards, but also finding a little time to get to know each other outside of work. Hiking the trails surrounding the city, exploring the many museums, galleries, art festivals, and of course, finding time to search for the world's best green chili breakfast burrito. And speaking of food, one auspicious day at lunch at the Opera Cantina, I happened to be sat next to Robert Mayer, who worked for the company. I mentioned that I enjoyed hiking and, well, 
Long story short, after many hours of exhausting hiking and a fair amount of opera shop talk later, we were married. And ever since then, along with our two young children, we proudly call Santa Fe our home. But enough about me. Let's turn the storytelling over to a professional. I'm pleased to introduce dramaturg Corey Ellison, here to tell us more about Dvorak's Rusalka. Rusalka, of course, is a, a kind of a magical character. She's a supernatural character. Uh, a Rusalka in Slavic mythology is a water nymph. Um, and they're supposed to be immortal. Um, and the, the problem here is that uh, she wants to give up her, her immortal status because she falls in love with a mortal, this prince. And so she goes to a witch, this woman, uh, Yeji Baba, who tells her, well, um, I can make you human, but uh, you won't be able to speak. <laughs> You'll lose your power of speech and you will lose your immortality. And Rusalka, because she's so in love with the prince, chooses to do this. So she submits herself to that magic that Yeji Baba is able to perform. And uh, it has, unfortunately, tragic results. Dvorak himself is in a period where he's, you almost would say, obsessed by the idea of the supernatural. He's, uh, at, during the same period, written a, a bunch of orchestral music that deals with the supernatural as well. And also that brings in the element of, uh, of Czech folk, folklore and folk-like music. You can hear, it's very important in Dvorak's music in general, uh, the influence of Bohemian and Moravian folk music. And so he brings all of this into play in Rusalka. Our director of this production, David Pountney, who is a, a veteran English director, real master, he, uh, he sees this opera very much, not only from the mythological basis of it, which he takes very seriously, but also uh, looking at it through the lens of 1900, the year in which it was created. And he seeks to balance that um, timeless mythological origin of it and quality of it with the unavoidable um, truth that it's created uh, in a time of tremendous ferment in terms of European culture, world culture, um, particularly Freud. And so the setting becomes some sort of an institution. Um, he's, he's not being too specific about it, but it could be a school or a hospital or some sort of thing where uh, Rusalka is a young woman who is completely at the mercy of authority figures who do not have her best interests in mind. And it's the story of her trying to fully grow into her full womanhood, but being thwarted at every turn. Everybody's way into Rusalka, uh, everybody's first taste of it is the gorgeous song to the moon that Rusalka sings in the first act. It is, you know, Rusalka singing to the moon, uh, praying to the moon to protect the man that she's in love with, to watch over him and tell him how much she loves him. And it's just one of the most magical moments in all of opera. This summer was the first time Rizalka was to be performed on the stage at the Santa Fe Opera, directed by legendary Sir David Poutney and conducted by the Santa Fe Opera's own music director, Harry Bickett, with an extraordinary cast, including Eileen Perez, Alexandra Lobianco, Michaela Martins, Eric Cutler, and James Cresswell. It is terribly sad that we are not able to enjoy Rizalka as a fully staged production this summer, but I am thrilled to bring you two of the opera's most famous arias this evening. Firstly, I'm delighted to present the stunningly talented soprano, Eileen Perez. I met Eileen in 2017 when I was performing Exterminating Angel at the Metropolitan Opera, and she was singing the title role in Thais. We met briefly backstage, and let me tell you, Eileen is the epitome of glamour and charm, so hard to like. 
Eileen had her Santa Fe Opera debut in 2011 as Marguerite and Faust. She returned in 2016 for Romeo et Juliette and this evening joins us from Chicago. Eileen is accompanied by our head of music staff, Robert Tweeten, and together they bring you the song to the moon.
bravi and cheers, Eileen and Bob. What a heartfelt performance. I think I'm going to have to wipe down my goosebumps. The Song to the Moon provides a mere taste of Rizalka's musical riches. Rizalka has often been called Dvorak's most Wagnerian work, not only for its treatment of orchestra and voice and for its subtle use of leitmotifs, but also for its shimmering impressionistic instrumentation, evoking waves and water, nocturnal forest sounds, and even the reflection of moonlight on the lake. Throughout the opera, Dvorak strives to balance the human world with the world of supernatural beings, making the fate of our heroine Rizalka all the more dramatic. For it is no longer merely a case of being caught between these two worlds, but being suspended between life and death. And before our own world was suspended, stage director Sir David Poutney was working to bring these opposing forces to life on the Santa Fe Opera stage. I did have the good fortune to meet Sir David in 2011 when I sang in Andreas Chenier at the Bregenz Festival where he was intendant. Although when I met him, he was just plain old David. His pioneering productions have won him Janacek, Martinu and Olivier Awards. And just last year, Sir David was knighted for his services to opera. In our next segment, we are joined by world-renowned conductor and our very own music director, Harry Bickett, along with Eileen Perez to share their perspectives on Dvorak's opera. Sir David joins us from France, Harry from Scotland, and of course, Eileen from Chicago. Let us welcome them virtually to the Santa Fe Opera. <laughs> welcome, Eileen and David. So Eileen, you're, you're, in, you're in New York, I'm in Chicago. You're in Chicago, but yes. have you been there the whole time for? Yes, I've been here quarantining since March 13th. Oh God, how's it been? Yeah. It's been, uh, well, you know, it's, it's coupled with a lot of social injustice issues at the moment in our country. So not only is it, you know, just the, the pandemic and how every state is treating it, but also, you know, a lot of unrest, uh, civil unrest. And of course it's a big voting year so um, as much as we are just trying to keep healthy, we're also trying to encourage theaters to think creatively and hopefully continue efforts to be creative and supportive and fundraising through all of this. So, you know, just a little bit of work here and there. Absolutely. Well, I, I'm in deeper Scotland where I think the, the term self-isolation was probably invented. Mm. And in fact, <laughs> So life really hasn't changed here very much at all because no one ever sees each other anyway. Uh, David, you're in, you're in France? Uh, I'm in deep rural France, yes. And actually my, my, my neighbor, the farmer, um, said to me the other day, um, you know, I, I'd never come across this word self-isolating before, but now I realize I've been doing it for 60 years. <laughs> exactly, that's funny. But move, moving on to Rusalka, which is what we are here to talk about. I, 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 one of the first operas I actually ever saw, David, was was your 1983 production at um, English National Opera, and I mean I remember so much about that. And I'm just I'm interested that a piece that was written right at the turn of the century, 1901, and was hugely popular in its own day, took quite so long to get to to London. Um, in fact, the Met didn't even do it until 1993. What was your kind of first, when did it first come on your radar as a piece? And what, what sort of drew you to, to, choosing it, to choosing to stage it all those years ago? Well, I, I, I as, you, as you probably know, I got into the Czech repertoire via Janáček. And, and um, I listened to a lot of Janáček when I was a student. And actually my first sort of serious production, professional production was Katja Kabanova in 1972. So uh, as a result of that, um, I actually studied in some depth all the Czech composers. Uh, and I've done, I don't know, three or four different Smetana operas. Um, and I, I studied all the Dvorak pieces quite, quite carefully. Um, what interests me very much I suppose is is and and if you look at the other Dvorak operas, that I think this would this would become very evident. Um, 
is that Dvorak is himself not innocent of this piece. The music is not innocent. It's very beautiful, but it's full of a rich ambiguity of harmony. And, you know, we are in a post Tristan world uh, in, in the music. And that's something very different from any of his other pieces. His other pieces all have, are in a much more innocent frame of mind. But this, in this piece, he, he allowed his music to explore psychological ambiguity, um, of course, expressed by harmonic ambiguity and, and richness and, and, and so on. Um, and, and that's very interesting. I don't think he ever really wrote about it. I mean, it's, it's influenced by the text, obviously, because the text is, is an Art Nouveau text. I mean, Fabio was a sort of very much an Art Nouveau artist. So you're listening to the language of Middle Europe in of Vienna, Middle European, um, uh, what was then avant-garde write, uh, writing, um, yeah. and that must have steered Dvorak in a certain in a certain way towards a, a new richness and subtlety. Yeah, it's unlike anything else. It's amazing. Um, Aileen, you, this was going to be your role debut, is that right? Yes. This would be also my first, um, I sang the Dvorak Requiem a couple of years ago, um, but this is the only Dvorak uh, opera that I've delved into. And all I hear um, is a very strong sense of the use of water and the sound of even that ambiguity of, of the power of water and also the mirror quality of water and I see also in the dramatic structure when the music of Vodnik and Rusalka is beginning that that water world so to speak comes back um, I just find it completely fascinating in in all of the metaphors that can be attached to it whether it's Freudian or just the psychological for me it's very much you know the seeking of something you think you don't have but you've had all along and yet there's also a sense of each character being finding their happiness and their real joy where where they are or eventually where they go. So even though, you know, I see Yeji Baba and it would have been great to, you know, to connect with all of the artists and hear how they feel their journey and how the water or their uh, earth life or, you know, the human world, what they think and how they feel and hear that music. Um, how that affects their character and how it's so different from all the other scores of Fuccini and Verdi and Mozart <laughs> and Wagner. Um, that would have been fun to, to just have that experience and then speak from those perspectives. Um, and do you, uh, this is the first time you sung in Czech? Yes, yes. And yes. What, what, what are the challenges of that? I think that, first of all, I love the role because it's not extremely high. And it's this, again, we're talking about this water world. I mean, what could be more lyric and stunning? And yet when it gets dramatic, it stays low. So the challenge is letting, getting through the consonant clusters like <laughs> all of those or um, Spoming of Zbudi, Zbudi, you know, just to get through. The, obviously, we only recognize words through how the consonants shape the vowels, so it's very tricky, but a lot of fun. A lot. I can, more I can tell you, as a, as a conductor, <laughs> the, the, the challenge is because we always try and move on the vowel, not on the consonant. Yeah. Oh. Check is a nightmare because you have to know exactly how long it's going to take before you actually get the vowel. <laughs> And I'm often hanging there going, please get through this. You know, even in the, the song, the blau, 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 I say blau just to give more space, but blau dish and then shirokem. I like to put a little space so that it's not as, anyway. Yeah, it's a fascinating language that I am, is sonically, it, it reminds me of how the German language works, but of course it also has Latin roots in there that I can hear. So like da daleco is very close to Spanish dalejos, which is relatable. Um, so I find the connection to the language beautiful, sonic, but a whole lot of consonants to <laughs> get through. Absolutely. Well, look, I you know despite losing this this season, we, we we're, we're definitely going to do this piece. 
And, I hope you know, so too. It's going to happen. So I, I really so look forward to seeing both of you like thank in person you. properly in Santa Fe when we when we do it. And thank you both for joining this episode of Songs from the Santa Fe Opera. Thank you, Harry, Sir David, and Eileen. I really had no idea we had Sir David to thank for introducing Western audiences to this Czech masterpiece, Bravo. We now welcome American bass James Cresswell, who was to perform the role of Vodnik this summer in his Santa Fe Opera debut. James and I sang together at the English National Opera in the production of Turandot some hmm, 11 years ago, but who's counting? While we're unable to bring James to the stage this summer, we are overjoyed to welcome him virtually this evening. James is accompanied by renowned conductor David Cowan, head of music at Opera North, and both James and David now join us from England to present Vodnik's aria.
Ravi, James and David, such a moving aria and so passionately sung, thank you. And a resounding thank you to all our friends tailgating at home. We are so grateful to have you with us on what would have been the opening night of Rizalka. I imagine you may not think of The Little Mermaid quite the same after tonight. I hope the enchanting power of Dvorak's music brought you a bit closer to Santa Fe this evening. The Crosby Theatre truly is not the same without all of you. I look forward to when we are all able to enjoy the magic of live opera together again. Until then, we will continue to bring you music and opening night cheer virtually. And in return, if I may, I ask you to consider a gift to the Santa Fe Opera. Your gift will be matched dollar for dollar by a group of generous friends having twice the impact and providing twice the support. If you're not usually a donor but purchase tickets to performances, I ask that you consider donating what you would have spent on those tickets. We will be back on the stage once the pandemic is behind us and that day cannot come soon enough. But until then, it is with the support of fans and friends like you that we will keep the spirit of the Santa Fe Opera strong. Thank you for considering this request and thank you for being with us this evening. Please join us next Saturday, August 1st, for the grand finale of Songs from the Santa Fe Opera, celebrating Huang Ro and David Henry Wang's new opera, M. Butterfly, not to be confused with Madame Butterfly. Based on the Tony Award-winning play, M. Butterfly tells the true story of a diplomat who falls in love with a beautiful opera singer but looks are not what they seem, and it's revealed that both the diplomat and the diva are keeping secrets. Join us next week for a preview of this world premiere. The evening will be hosted by tenor Joshua Dennis, who was to sing the role of Mark, and also joining us from Paris will be countertenor Justin Kim. We will be right here again at 7 p.m. Mountain Time, 9 p.m. Eastern Time, Thank you so much for joining us. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a wrap. Happy opening night! Yay!